Are all drum sample libraries created equally? That's what we're going to talk about today in this video. And uh, spoiler alert, no, they're not. Now, I'm not talking about the differences in the tone or the choice of snare or kick drum or any of that stuff. That's totally separate. What we're talking about is the quality of the actual recording and how the files are prepared for the drum sampler. Why should you care about this? Well, it's because there's no quality control in the world of drum samples. So samples from one library might be prepared and timed and aligned differently than samples from another library. And if you're not aware, that can cause a lot of problems, especially if you decide to layer multiple samples, which seems to be a thing that a lot of people like to do to make their songs a little bit more unique. The actual drum samples that we're going to be looking at in this video today is by Bogren Digital. It's the signature drum sample library that they just released. We're going to pull them into a session. We're going to talk about what you should be listening for when you layer different samples. We're also going to talk about some common mistakes I see all the time and also how to look at your drum sample libraries to make sure that you're going to get it to sound as good as possible. Hope you guys are having a wonderful day today. My name is Bobby Balo, and I'm the mixing and mastering engineer at Raytown Productions. I help home studio owners and bedroom producers make better sounding music without buying expensive gear or unnecessary plugins. If you're new to my channel, thank you so much for being here. I put out new videos every single week, so be sure to hit that subscribe button because you do not want to miss a single video. They're going to help you make better sounding music. And before we jump into the video, I want to share a little gift with you. I put together my favorite free mixing and mastering plugins that I use all the time. It's all compiled into a single PDF that you can download. There's a link to that in the description. So this guide has everything from compressors, clippers, limiters, to delays, reverbs, and even a mastering grade sample rate converter. It's all in this PDF. I know you're going to find it incredibly valuable, so be sure to download that after this video. All right, so let's talk about some things that you should be considering when buying your next drum library. So the first thing that you need to be aware of is to make sure that you're buying a drum library that is compatible with your sampler that you're using. So some samplers have proprietary file formats like Native Instruments, for example. Their contact player has NKI file format. So if you buy a drum library that doesn't have that, you're not going to be able to really easily integrate it in with Native Instruments. The most universal file format available is probably WAV files. So those are literally just the recorded sound files that you can drag and drop into pretty much any sampler that I'm aware of. If you do a lot of rock or metal productions, you probably are aware of Slate Digital's Trigger plugin. That's one that I tend to use. It automatically detects drum hits, so you can just add the samples you want to replace it with and put it in. Or if you want to augment your drum sound that you already have, you can just turn the mix knob down. And so you're getting a blend of your samples and the original drum audio. Trigger uses its own format called TCI files, but it also comes with its own editor. So if you want to make your own TCI files, that's included when you buy Trigger. So you can do that yourself as long as you have access to the WAV files. There are other formats, but having those three is a really good starting spot because it gives you the most flexibility. Okay, so the second thing that you need to be aware of is the number of velocity layers that are included for each drum or cymbal. Why does that matter? It matters because it helps with dialing in specific articulation for your drums. If you want them to sound lifelike, having more velocity layers allows you to really have more control over the, the tone and the dynamics of your drums. You probably have heard like the infamous machine gun snare sound or machine gun kick drum sound and some really fast metal songs. Those types of samples typically only have like one velocity layer and so they really can't control the dynamics. It's just all the way on all the time. What I find is that having about five velocity layers is going to give you an enormous amount of flexibility. And so try to find libraries that have a minimum of five. Those will range from the hardest snare hits possible to just barely tapping it for ghost notes. Again, it's all about how realistic you want your drums to sound. The third thing you should be considering when you're buying your next sample library is the number of drum samples per velocity layer. 
the way drum sampling typically works is that for each velocity layer, the software is going to decide to play one sample from that velocity layer pool. So the larger the sample pool you have, the longer it takes before you hear a repeating sample. And so for complicated drums or really fast drums or fast fills where there's a lot of notes in a row, having more samples to choose from is going to help mask the fact that you're recycling some of those drum samples. And finally, the last thing I recommend is to find a drum sample pack that gives you some flexibility between the direct dry microphones and the ambient or overhead or the more spacious microphones. That way you can really process the dry microphones different from how you typically would process overheads or room mics. And again, this just comes down to giving you more flexibility and giving you an ability to be more creative as well. So those are four things to think about when you're gonna go purchase your next drum library. Now what I wanna do is show you what to look for in the samples themselves to make sure that they're set up right so when you're using them, when you're layering them, you're not gonna put yourself in a bad position by putting a bunch of samples that have mixed phases all on top of each other and then it just sounds like crap. I do wanna mention that the absolute best thing that you could do is spend a little bit of time look through all the samples you have and find the one that fits the song. I do not ever recommend just trying to find something that kind of sounds okay and then adding a bunch of samples on top of that. You're complicating the process and in the end, it's more often than not, it's gonna sound way worse than if you were just to find that one right sample. And when you're auditioning these drum samples, be sure to have the other instruments playing because you'll have no idea how it's gonna sound once it's stacked up against a bunch of guitars or vocals or whatever. Now, layering can work, but you need to make absolutely sure that the samples are phase aligned as much as possible. Okay, so they need to be the same polarity. Now, I wanna show you what an out of phase snare sounds like so you can identify it or at least know what to listen for when you go through your drum sample libraries and try to figure out how in phase the different samples are that you have. So to put these mics out of phase, what I'm going to do is just flip the phase of one of the tracks and I'm gonna play them both together and you'll be able to hear it. It's gonna sound really thin when the phase is flipped and when it's not, it should have this low, thick body to the snare. Okay, so samples that tend to be out of phase, you'll notice that because it'll be missing the low end. It won't have the punch of the body anymore. You might still have the snap sound, so try to ignore that and just listen to the low end of the snare. Here we go. Now let me flip the phase on this and bring it back to be in phase. So when the snare had that full body, those samples are totally in phase, okay? So if you hear that really tinny snare sound, you know that it's probably out of phase and you need to go and invert one of the drum samples. In some place where this happens a lot is when you mix a top and bottom snare mic together. So a lot of drum libraries will have top and bottom snare mics. So hopefully they've already inverted the polarity of the bottom snare mic to match the top or it will sound thin. So let me show you what that looks like. Okay, you hear there's a nice punch to that low end. Let's invert the phase to put it out of phase and listen to what happens to our low end. So there's like this nice thick crack, maybe like around 100 hertz, that is there when the samples are in phase with each other. So if you layer samples, make sure you're paying attention to that low frequency formation on the snare or kick drum or any of the other direct samples that you might have in your drum library, because if you had the polarity wrong, you'll lose all of the punch. All these samples that I'm showing here, these are all from one single snare in that Bogren Digital drum pack. Okay, this is all from the Wanker snare. We have six different velocity layers. So typically five or more is a really good starting point. And in addition to that, we have six different 
snare samples per velocity layer. The likelihood of us being able to hear that repeating pattern that the drum sampler is going to produce by playing really fast snare rolls or whatever is pretty unlikely. I think they did a really good job getting enough samples to really cover a broad spectrum of fast music with a lot of fills. So in this particular drum library, we have top mic, we have a bottom mic, ambience mic, grunge mic, which is probably just like a SM57 or something. Typically these are mono. I think these ones are actually stereo, but it's just like a pair of mics you have laying around that you just set up just to see what happens it's like for those creative accidents and then we also have a pair of overheads okay so the first thing we want to look at is to make sure that all of these direct mics so like the top and bottom microphones uh, for a snare drum or on a kick drum you might have like an in and out microphone all those microphones should have the same polarity that means that when you zoom in on the waveform of your samples when you bring them into your session they should all go in the same direction initially okay so if we look here we see that they all start at about the same starting point which is very important okay that's going to ensure that we have phase coherency throughout all these samples and they all go down so if we look you can see them all first first thing that they do is they all go down so we start here and we can even just set a marker like where this is going up and just look visually and you'll see that every single one of these looks almost identical right we have this down and then up motion okay so that tells us like i said that these are all in phase with each other now if we look at the bottom mics it should have a similar behavior okay if if it looks the opposite so for example it looks like this, where the top mics are all going down first, and this goes up first. That is a polarity inversion, so we need to fix that. So you need to flip the polarity somehow. So in Cubase, you can just do phase reverse. A lot of the sampling plugins will have a little circle with a line through it. That's also a polarity adjustment, so you can just click that, and it'll invert the polarity and do this automatically for you. Now this should be more in phase with that. Okay, so it's very important to double check this the whole way through because sometimes people forget to flip the polarity of the bottom mics. I've done it. All right, so this all looks good. So this is great. The closer that these mimic each other, the tighter the phase coherency. So that's something to keep in mind. These can also be partially out of phase. So for example, let's say that we have this sample and it's shifted a little bit. It starts a little bit later because the microphones weren't at the same distance on the snare drum. At this point, you have to use your best judgment as to which sounds better. Does it sound better like this or does it sound better with inverted polarity? And the only way to know that is to try that. And again, you're going to want to focus your tension on the low end. Okay, so listen to the low energy of everything. Let's just try to see what it sounds like, and then we'll try to make a decision together if it sounds better with the polarity flipped or not. And let's invert the polarity. So it's kind of hard to tell, right? In my opinion, it sounds like with the polarity flipped, again, there's a little bit more of that low, like 100 hertz in there. But depending on how the song is arranged, maybe it would sound better with all the instruments in to not have it flipped. In that case, it's totally fine to leave it as is. Okay, so you really have to use your ear to identify what the best decision is for the music. You're just looking at these waves, waveforms only takes you so far, but it'll at least help you identify if there's probably an issue or not. Now, if you use drum samples to augment or just kind of add an additional characteristic to a real drum sound that you have, you also want to try flipping the polarity as well because your live drum recording, the phase of all that stuff might not mesh well with the samples. And until you invert the polarity and really listen, you will never know if you could be getting a little bit more out of your samples by just flipping that button. There's one more thing I want to talk about, and that's room microphones and overheads. So I just got done saying that they should all be perfectly aligned, right? And they should be tight to each other and that the waveform should overlap. 
That's not necessarily the case with overheads in room mics. The reason being is that those microphones are physically farther away from the drum kit. There's an inherent delay in time for the sound to get to those microphones. So there's no way that the direct recorded sound is going to match up with the overheads or the room mics. This is the bottom snare, so this is a direct mic. Look at how much longer it takes for the sound to get into these room mics, okay? This is totally fine. But to know what the best relationship in terms of phase is between this bottom microphone and this ambient microphone is to have them being played and then flipping the polarity again. And again, it's probably going to be more subtle. The enhancement that you're going to hear is usually in the low end, okay? So always focus in that low body region of the snare or kick drum when you're doing these polarity inversions. And then just trust your gut instinct on what you think sounds better. And if you can't for the life of you tell a difference, then don't worry about it. Either one will probably sound fine. So if you're curious, you can see here's the delay for the overheads. And actually, let's do a little, uh, let's get a little nerdy here. We can actually calculate how far away the microphones are from the snare. So let's do that. So we know the snare drum starts at zero, right? Because the waveform goes down immediately. So if we measure the time it takes right here. Okay, so this is, if we zoom way in, about 3.7-ish milliseconds. So the speed of sound and air is like... 1125 feet per second or something like that and it's going to change depending on humidity and temperature and all that but you know we can get close enough with this so 1125 3.7 so the overheads are about four feet away from that snare drum mic so i mean that's i feel like that would be yeah that's about the right spot maybe a little bit low um now i'm really curious actually about where these ambient mics are Let's figure that out quickly. So again, this is like 15.5-ish. So we can do the same thing. About 17 feet away. So that's, those microphones are pretty far away. So that's probably why it sounds so awesome. It does have a really cool sound. Let me just play one for you. So I mean, yeah, it sounds like those mics are far away from the snare drum. So there you go. Now you learn something maybe all the weird things that we can figure out by just looking at the drum samples. So this drum library by Bogren Digital passes my seal of approval in terms of technically assembling everything in the right way. No matter what samples you use, how you mix it, you're going to get a good sounding result every single time. Now, even though Bogren Digital did an awesome job with all the attention to detail on the face alignment of everything, that doesn't mean that when you add samples from a different manufacturer or maybe your own samples, that they're going to match. So be sure to implement some of those things that we talked about earlier in this video, especially flipping the polarity and listening for that low end to fill in or go away. And if you're curious if you should pick up these samples, I can't make that decision for you, but I have had a really good experience trying these out in different sessions that I've worked on. Drum tones are a very personal decision that you have to make as a mixing engineer. But if you like Jens Bogren's sound, I would highly recommend it because they are literally the same samples that he has in his personal collection. There's a ton of reviews out on YouTube. Definitely go and check some of those out. And if you are interested in picking up a copy of this drum library, I have a 10% off coupon just for you for watching this video. I have that coupon code in the description. So when you go to buy it, just enter it in the promo code section, you're going to get 10% off. Also, that coupon code helps support my channel by giving me a small commission. It's like basically buying me a cup of coffee for spending my weekends making these videos for you. It's a win-win and a nice way to say thank you. So your homework assignment for tonight or maybe this next coming week is to go through all of your drum samples, pull as many as you can into a session, and look at the timing and the polarity of the samples. Start with your snare drums and kick drums. Those usually are going to be the most important for augmenting your drum sound. Depending on the manufacturer, you're going to see a whole lot of weird stuff happening.
And as long as you're aware of that, you'll be able to make the necessary adjustments when you're mixing. And also, if you see anything, be sure to come back here and leave a comment below. Let me know which sample libraries are incompatible. It'd be nice to have a resource for everybody to use, just so that they're aware that some samples will be completely out of phase with other ones. So if you found this video helpful or you learned something today, please give this video a thumbs up. That tells YouTube that this video is actually useful and it's going to show it to more people. And the best thing you can do to support me is to share this video or one of my other videos with your friends or on social networks like Facebook and Reddit. There's a lot of people struggling to mix and master their own music, so I'm sure they'll be thankful that you shared a good resource with them. With that, Thank you so much for your time and attention today, and I'll see you in another video.